Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The discussion that I am going to have with you this evening is not an extraordinarily happy one. It will, for some of you who have taken some of my courses, you will hear some themes that are similar. But I come to you tonight on the subject of race in America with, 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 a, with a heart that is not leaping with joy and anticipation of easy years ahead. The summer had bookends uh, it be on race. It began in June with the decision by the Supreme Court of the United States uh, on a case that came up from Louisville, Kentucky and Seattle, Washington. And in each city the elected school board had decided, after looking at the distribution of children in its schools, that for the betterment of the education of the school children in each of these cities, that they should implement a program, programs, separate programs, in which um, a greater degree of racial integration would be achieved. In each instance, some white parents objected to the plans because their children were, not, were denied the choices that the parents deemed favor, favorable and appropriate for their children. In his majority opinion, deciding that the plans were unconstitutional, the Chief Justice wrote a careless aphorism. The best way to stop discrimination by race is to stop discriminating by race. Two weeks ago, the New York Times, in a front page story, delivered the second bookend, reporting that the school system in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, had rejected the complaints of black parents that the Tuscaloosa schools were, for all intents and purposes, resegregated to the degree that they had been segregated before Brown versus the Board of Education. Well, I got an email from a former student, a very favorite student of mine, named Conaway Haskins III, who was here at George Mason um, in the late 80s, and is now a principal aide to Senator Jim Webb. <laughs> His email simply said, what do we do now? And this evening, I'm, going, I'm trying to provide my answer to the question that Conaway and others have been asking over the summer. My frame for looking at this question has been long in coming. It began 50 years ago. <laughs> 
when my draft board kind of misplaced me, couldn't figure out what to do with me, and said, come back a year from now. So I was in limbo, and in that limbo time, I got a job with the Cuyahoga, Ohio, the Cuyahoga County Welfare Department. Cuyahoga County is Cleveland. And for a year, I had unparalleled access to the homes of some of the most impoverished people in America. And they were all, most all black. And I saw in excruciating detail what poverty and compacted, crowded poverty did for human beings. I also observed the blundering on, of huge organizations in dealing with the poor and the disdain in the approaches of many of my colleagues, both black and white, to the clients we were serving. And I also, at the tender age of uh, 25, was exposed to the horror for children living in neighborhoods of cement-like, intractable poverty. And I will never forget the plea of one of the mothers in my caseload. Mister, won't you please get my girls out of this project? It will ruin them and when I am ruined, when they are ruined, I will die. The other part of the frame was supplied 25 years ago. My wife, who I married when she was almost 39 and I was almost 49, and I lived in a middle-class housing development that was right across the street, right across Delaware Avenue in Washington, from a public housing project. And the middle class people and the poor people didn't really mix very much except in a safe way. And one day when we were in the safe way and Patricia was substantially pregnant and also had traces of gray in her hair, um, we encountered a teenage girl from the projects who was pregnant. And she couldn't believe Patricia because in her world, people Patricia's age were grandmothers at least. And so to see this woman with gray in her hair, just it, it was as if she was seeing, I don't know, a polar bear. <laughs> um, but we paid attention because she was going to deliver at about the same time that Patricia was going to deliver. And I harked back to what I knew from, had learned, had learned 25 years earlier about what her apartment across the street must be like. And as we began to stock our child's room with books, I wondered if there were books being stocked across the street. I also knew that my wife was getting wonderful prenatal care. She and I both worked. She's a law professor at Georgetown. Her diet was carefully thought out. And we followed the latest fads. We played the kind of music that you play for the kids in the 
uterus. We, 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 we talk to her. The theory was that if you talk, the child will be more oral and more vocal. And I can tell you that person is now 24 years old. And if I had it do over again, I wouldn't talk to her in the future. <laughs> But we realized that these two children, when they came home, would be totally different. Our child would come home to a house where there were books for her. She came to a home where there was a room for her. She came to a home where there were books all over the place and magazines and newspapers. And she came to a home where her parents read to her, where the parents had enough money to hire a smart, good, loving nanny, parents who read to her all the time, and doctors who regulated her diet. Well, I got in the habit of taking some books across the street, and I, there was no man. There were several women. I couldn't figure out which was the grandmother, which was the great-grandmother. There were more TVs in the small apartment than there were books, as far as I could tell. And I knew, I knew, that those girls at three would not belong in the same nursery school. At five, not the same kindergarten, and on up to 21, they wouldn't belong in the same economy. And that came to pass. When she was 21, our child was uh, a senior at Yale. By 21, the other girl had disappeared gone away. Her family did not know where. The compounded issues of poverty, education, and race cannot be understood without history. You can't talk about this tangled subject without delving deeply into our history. And ignorance of this history leads people to shallow and faulty analyses, bad public policies, and very bad judicial doctrine. There is no way to understand the trap that that child and the two girls in my caseload back in Cleveland we're born into without a good grasp of the formation of our national culture. The outlines of that trap began to take shape in what was to become our country more than a century before we declared our independence from Great Britain. It came with the conclusion of the Virginia colonists that it was not a violation of Christian belief to enslave unchristian people. The decision was made not about blacks, but about Native Americans. Then in 1676, in Virginia, a fellow named Nathaniel Bacon led a Rebellion. It's a weird rebellion. Bacon had a little army of poor whites, landless whites, who had served out their indentured servitude and now were landless, and poor blacks who were free. And the governor let them put this little army together in order to fight Indians. Indians. 
But the governor wouldn't let them fight the Indians the way they wanted to fight the Indians, which was to kill a whole bunch of Indians all at once. So they turned on the governor, ran him and his, his entourage out of Jamestown and onto the boats in the harbor. And it terrified, it terrified the leaders of the colony. And they decided this will never happen again. And the response was to divide and conquer, to welcome the poor whites into the white club and explain to them the privileges of whiteness. But since huge, the, the economy was essentially tobacco growing, they needed workers and they told the slaves, the, 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 the poor whites, that they were better than any of these Native Americans and as they already felt, or these black slaves. They emphasized the salience of whiteness and entitlement. And they inculcated a racial contempt. So that no matter how miserable a white person might be, he always had the indispensable psychic insurance policy. At least I'm better than those people. Now, when I was a 12 year old, uh, my mother, who was a widow, and we lived in Harlem, married a physician um, who lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And in 1944 in Grand Rapids, there weren't very many. And he, this poor guy, he's nice, he was a very, my stepfather, a very nice man and very, very calm with us, really. Uh, but he married a woman, a kid, and a mother in law. So he needed a fairly big house. And they didn't have any decent, fairly big houses in the black community in uh, Grand Rapids. But my stepfather was, um, though by the laws of the country, legally black, he looked like a white guy, straight hair, green eyes. And um, so he went and he bought a house in a big enough. It was in a working class white neighborhood, way outside the black neighborhood. And after a while, I guess when he brought us, he, they realized he was black. Oh, they got very upset. People were talking, talking about burning down the house. Or, I mean, it was really pretty terrible. Um, and it was... The school was out, so I didn't meet anybody. And I just spent my time riding my bicycle all over the town until our paper boy, a kid named Jerry Child, who was about my age, said, I've got a bike. Why don't we take a ride together? And Jerry and I became pretty inseparable, and I got to know his family and where he lived. He lived above a store ramshackle store. Um, his mother ran the store and his father, as far as I could see, only drank beer. That's what he did. And there are just brown beer bottles all over the place where he sat. And Jerry and I had a wonderful time for about three weeks. And then one day he appeared at the house and I heard my mother who answered the door say, Jerry, why are you crying? And as I walked into the room, Jerry was answering my mother, and he said, uh, I can't play with Roger anymore. She said, why? He said, my father won't let me. He says, we're better than you people. My father, my stepfather was a doctor. My mother had a, she was a Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Minnesota. We're better than you people. And it came down from that kind of racial contempt that I talked about that was inculcated into the culture at the time of Bacon's rebellion. Well, they then began in the last quarter of the 17th century. They began to, uh, the Virginians, to import great numbers of blacks. And by 1700, uh, the richest 
landowner um, and biggest slave owner in Virginia was a fellow named Robert Carter, who was so rich they called him King, King Carter. And King Carter brought into American culture one of the worst things that could occur. He decided that he would rule his blacks by disabling any of them who might or looked like they might resist his will. Or if they ran away, certainly they would be disabled. He called it seasoning. He would uh, cut off an ear or some toes or some fingers to let them know that they were totally subject to the will of the master. And the, so into the American culture, there slithered the horrible practice of disabling black people to keep them inferior. One of the most effective ways of disabling blacks came into the Virginia Codes fairly soon after that, and that was that people were forbidden to teach blacks to read or anything else. Also, there was uh, no re to be no religious practice, no gathering, no politics. And so, as I've said many times before, it's no wonder the Virginians were so good at assembling the architecture of freedom because they practiced on developing the architecture of unfreedom, so they knew how to protect their own. Nevertheless, with white sympathizers, and I have to say this, they were white sympathizers with the black cause from the 17th century on. First it was Quakers, but then it was more and more some Virginians who just couldn't abide the lives that they were leading. But blacks began their struggle upwards. They would take their own freedom. The owners called it running away. Well, the little children run away. These people decided they didn't want to be lifelong prisoners on a prison farm. And so they would try to go to the north and take their freedom. They would plot rebellions, and few of them came almost to fruition. And one, Nat Turner's, did come to fruition, and a lot of people got killed. They also uh, malingered and broke tools when they, when they uh, in a resistance. They also worked individually to buy their own freedom, which many did. Not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds maybe, bought their own freedom from their masters. They began to create organizations and churches to better themselves. And one of them, the loveliest uh, um, juxtapositions in American life, in my view, is that in the summer of 1787, when the leaders of the United States were in what we now call the Constitutional Convention, writing the Constitution of the United States in, which I should say there were three clauses which strengthened and supported slavery. But at the same time this was going on, two black men, Absalom Jones and, and, and uh, Richard Allen, created the first organized black organization designed to help black people. And it was called the Free Africa Society. Jones went on to become the first black Episcopal minister in the United States, and Allen created what is now the one of the largest black denominations, he helped be founded uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church. These people were people. They were active. They wanted to get out of slavery. They wanted to know how to read. They put reading together with uh, with with with. with freedom. 
they created the Underground Railroad in which um, many northern abolitionists participated. And they produced perhaps my, one of my favorite American heroes, Harriet Tubman, who was a slave down here in the eastern shore of Maryland, I was deaf in one ear because her master had hit her in the head. But she took her own freedom, left, went to Philadelphia. She was a seamstress, a very skilled one. She made money, and she then, when she had some money, she would go back to Maryland, and she would bring some other slaves out, and she'd go back. she back time and time again. It's estimated that she helped free 300 people. Again, she had white white helpers. Then came the Civil War. And blacks joined the federal army as fast as they could. They fought in this war as they had fought in the War of 1812 and in the revolution. But as they were straggling up from slavery, the perhaps the most massive backlash against blacks that ever occurred in the United States did occur. I should say that there were three periods in three different centuries of American life when there was movement, significant movement toward black freedom and, and incorporation into America. The first was after the Civil War, I mean, after the Revolutionary War. There were people in the country, white people, who said, we have to live by the principles we just fought for, and those principles of freedom. And how can we have freedom for ourselves and not for them? And so, for a while, states in the North began to outlaw slavery. But there was a pushback, a massive pushback, in that the Southerners helped to develop what was then the Southwest, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi. For that, they needed slave power. For that, the Northeasterners were ready to provide the slaves. So the, that was the first massive backlash in pushing slavery into the west of the then south. There was, after the Civil War, Reconstruction in which blacks participated, were protected by the new amendments to the Constitution, the 13th, freeing the slaves, the 14th, providing due process and equal protection to the newly freed former slaves, and the 15th Amendment providing the right to vote to black men. But this was a massive backlash, a backlash designed to essentially um, render those three amendments to the Constitution um, null and void. Um, there was terrorism, there was violence, there was murder, um, and blacks in the South were fairly quickly rammed back into a state that was, at the very best, it was semi-slavery. By the 20th century, the anger on blacks by the former Confederate states was still great, and there was invented perhaps the most fiendish of the disabling um, regimes. It was called segregation. What segregation was essentially was a coast to coast and border to border massive shunning of black people and of using the popular culture to diminish and demean black people. 
And segregation also came with um, a decision to deny black people the educations that they so desperately wanted. In 1905, Paul B. Berenger, who was then the president of the faculty at uh, the University of Virginia, which was the leading educational institution in the South at that time, made a speech to the Southern Education Association in which he said that uh, black people uh, should only be given a Sunday school education because they were only good as human beings as supply of cheap labor in warm climates. And by and large, his recommendations were uh, followed so that here you had a culture which defined blacks as inferior and then devised cultural understandings and public policies to turn blacks into the limited buffoons of their fantasies. And while some white people denied, some Southerners denied what they were doing, others knew quite well. Black people had to be kept down and in their place. President Theodore Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington, the leading black of his generation, to the White House for a meal. Um, in the early 20th century, between 1901 and 1905. The country went nuts. But the man who told the truth was a senator from South Carolina who was, named, who was called Pitchfork Ben Tillman, who stood up in all his majesty in the well of the United States Senate and said, because of what President Roosevelt did today, we will have to kill 3,000 niggers to keep them in their place. Disabling. Well, nevertheless, despite all that, black people did manage to create new little centers of learning. burial societies, small little banks. There was, in that terrible time after the Civil War, still efforts by black people to improve their own lot, self-help. In the 20th century, black men created a thing called the Niagara Movement, which tried to create a comprehensive program for black freedom. And Booker T. Washington had a college in Tuskegee, Alabama, which was getting a lot of money from northern white philanthropists. And he would not only build his own college, but hand it out to other blacks. And so there was beginning to be motion in the black community. But then, um, in 1908, there was a riot in Springfield, Illinois, which horrified, horrified the country and caused the creation of the NAACP. So, and right after that, the National Urban League. Those organizations were in place when World War II occurred. After World War II, there was the Brown v. Board of Education decision, which gave us the freedom, the, the, the impetus to create the civil rights movement that we're all familiar with. 
But because of that segregation was such an all-encompassing, daily grinding on the soul, the lawyers who did Brown versus the Board of Education were blasting at segregation. And I think they believed that once the segregation was broken, that white people could see the value in black people and would become friendly and fair. Thurgood Marshall's deputy said it most clearly. He said, we attacked segregation because we thought that segregation was the box we were in. And we hadn't thought about the culture of white supremacy. Well, there are people now who say that Brown v. Board of Education and the Civil Rights Movement was, uh, were overpraised. I think that is dead wrong. I mean, after all, if it hadn't been for the Civil Rights Movement, I couldn't have taught at uh, George Mason. George Johnson couldn't have hired me, and we couldn't have had an integrated student body. I say that lightly, but if you look through the country, you will see that the fact that we have universities that are integrated, that, use, that, that, that now use the talents of women, minorities, make these universities so much better than the University of Michigan that I went to in 1949 through 1956. When I was in college, I never was assigned a book, a play, a poem, or an essay by a black person or that suggested that black people had done anything useful in the history of the written word. I never had a black professor, or a Hispanic professor, or an Asian professor, or a female professor. We're so much better than that here, than they were then in all of their pride, that it is a journey that is unfathomable. So that the idea of the civil rights movement not having any substantive, substantial effect is just flat out wrong. So, but as with the two other movements forward, there was a backlash. Again, Richard Nixon was successful in, a, in getting elected on a Southern strategy. Ronald Reagan, for all of his uh, guileless, good-natured self, um, taught a lot of people what they wanted to learn, which was the fact that uh, black people had gotten too much during the Civil Rights Movement. and. He had great aphorisms. One of them was, uh, yeah, we had a war on poverty, and poverty won. And, uh, but Reagan and the Southerners who were fighting back had a lot of help in discouraging even whites with good feelings. There were the riots of the 60s. Very frightening violence. There was frightening rhetoric on the part of uh, blacks in urban movements. And after that went away, there was still street crime that is terrifying and ugly, and we're reminded of it frequently by front page episodes such as the attempted mugging of my neighbor, David Souter, an associate justice of the Supreme Court, or the murder in a safe neighborhood in Washington 
of my New York Times colleague and friend, David Rosenbaum. So the puzzlement is, for one thing, what do we do about people still trapped in these public housing projects that are breeders of crime and wasted lives? And also, as some people ask, why are some blacks different? Been asked many times, why are you different? It's pure luck. Pure luck. Black people who got out of the, whose, whose ancestors got out of the South early did a lot better than those who are unlucky, whose ancestors got out of the South later. In my own family, for example, my grandfather, who wasn't really a wonderful fellow, but he was run out of Mississippi at the end of the 19th century because he had broken a cardinal rule of Mississippi culture. And that is, when a white man hit him with a whip, instead of cowering and crying and running away, Grandpa grabbed the whip and hit him back. So the city fathers of Holly Springs, Mississippi, went to my great-grandfather, who was a former slave, and they said, Uncle Asbury, you're a good nigger. We like you, but your boy Willie is crazy. If you don't get him out of here by nightfall, we're going to kill him. So Grandma and Grandpa left on the afternoon train to Memphis. And ultimately, my father and his siblings were raised in Minnesota rather than Mississippi. And instead of working in the cotton fields, when they got big, they went to the University of Minnesota. That's luck. That's just luck. That has nothing to do with me. It changed the entire trajectory of their lives and mine. Well, that brings me back to Conaway's question. What do we do now? We can't go back and turn the clock back and get a lot of people out. We have to figure out what to do about those children who are being eaten up in the inner cities every day in every way. My own view is that we have to do it through the schools. I uh, served for six years on the board of the University of the District of Columbia and for two years on the school board of the District of Columbia. There are schools in that school system where you wouldn't send your worst enemy's child. Oh, maybe you'd send bin Laden's child, but almost nobody else's. They are just terrible. They just shriek at the kids. You're no good. You're third rate. We don't really think much of you. Sit down, shut up. And, but worse, These schools didn't engage the parents. They didn't want to see the parents. And I kept thinking when I was on that school board about that girl who used to live across the street from us. Finally, I found what I believe is a fruitful thing to think about. And that is that there's a movement for what are called community schools wrapping services around schools in areas 
of great poverty and great need. To those of you who are old enough to remember the poverty program of the 60s that uh, came out of Lyndon Johnson's presidency, there was a program called the Community Action Program where local people had to form organizations which had the skills enough to do substantive, positive things in their communities. Sometimes they would do health care, sometimes they would do nursery schools, sometimes they would do a combination of those and employment training. I think we need community schools, but I think we need community schools that are funded in big ways. The mother of that child across the street from where I lived had no idea of how to parent a child. None. And in communities like that, you can, you can decree all kinds of stuff. Condoms, abstinence. Boys who are restless and, and have no futures can only demonstrate their potency in manhood one way. The girls are under great pressure. And they're under enormous pressure if they don't have parents who know how to take care of them and how to help them take care of themselves and figure out strategies to um, protect themselves from unwanted pregnancies. Well, I want to have services like that, parent training programs in these inner city schools. I also want these programs in the inner city schools to be so attractive in terms of what they're providing for the kids that people in the community who want to volunteer and go and do things like sometimes just taking care of a kid until the mother gets home from work. Sometimes there will be doctors who come and check the kids, or nurses who come and check the kids, or reading teachers who do special reading teaching for the kids, or people who will come and take groups of children to the park, or to the museum, or to the playground. In the end, I am haunted by a conversation that I had with a wonderful man named Sam Proctor, who was a Baptist minister. And I met him here in the 60s when he was an officer in the Office of, of uh, Economic Opportunity. And he went on to New York after that, and he was pastor in a historic black church, the Abyssinia Baptist Church, which had previously been pastored by Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., and before that by Adam Clayton Powell, Sr. And some of you who are very old may remember Adam Clayton Powell as the black chairman of the House Education and Labor Committee, who was, uh, through whose committee went most of the, the positive legislation, the anti-poverty legislation, education legislation, that... Um, was passed in the Great Society program. After Adam died, Sam took that pulpit and he served on it for 17 years in central Harlem. When it was over and he retired, I said to Sam, I said, ask him, what's the biggest lesson you've learned in that seven years, 17 years at that church, Sam? And he looked at me with the saddest look of seen on any human face, and he said, all these parentless children, Roger, all these parentless children, children without parents are like people without skins. So my answer to Conaway is, let's find a way to give those kids some skin. <laughs>
not ordinary schools, but schools in steroids. Taking the model of the community action programs and putting them into these schools. Um, parental coaching, health care, extended day school, community service for children. Read, nurture, and coach both kids and parents. Job finding for parents. And the movement needs to be pushed by successful blacks. If it begins to get traction, white people will come. White people have always come, always been good white allies in these efforts. But blacks must lead. We've gone too long, done too many things for white people to even understand why this has to be done, but they will understand if we, instead of having a handout, go on and start to make these schools work. I want to conclude this by saying that um, The people who led the civil rights movement, by and large, were both friends and mentors of mine, and in one instance, a relative. And I have watched them die. And to my amazement and great sadness, a number of them have died very depressed because they saw the backlashes carry away much of the work they had done and that they had cared about so deeply, to which they had given their entire lives. One of them said on his deathbed, I made no difference. I might as well not have lived. That was not true. That was not true. We do have a different and better world now. But what was true was the 60s had such promise. We thought that we could solve all these problems all at one well, fell swoop. And we couldn't. And even for those of us who were young, there was a huge letdown. We had invested so much energy, so much effort, and in some cases so much bravery, that we called on reserves and reserves and reserves, and finally we were, we were, we were operating with no reserves. And we broke down, lots of us. I did. I look at it now and know it was post-traumatic stress syndrome. I know it was depression from the fact that we were leaving the poorest of the poor behind. But I learned something valuable, which I want to say to anybody who cares about these issues that I'm talking about. The road to justice cannot be traveled with a sprint. Can't even be a long distance run. It's a long distance relay. And the lives that those of us who were in the civil rights movement led were simply being carrying the baton for people who had taken long runs before we were even born. So to my friend Conway and to others who care, and I must say I am going to try to do these things, try to 
ignite these things in the days of my retirement. And I'm going to go. We've got some billionaires now in the black community. We ain't billionaires before. I don't know what an Oprah is, but I'm going to find out what an Oprah is and see if Oprah can do something for us. And then there's guys with bling, you know? All these bling. I'll try to tell these guys, to hell with the bling, let's save the children. The country has solved some of its racial problems. And I have to say, somebody who remembers what the Redskins were years ago, to say that our society has managed to integrate the quarterback position on the Washington Redskins, well, that's a lot. That is a lot. George Preston Marshall, who owned the Redskins, would not have any black athletes. And he was forced to have black athletes because the US government owns the stadium that is now called RFK. And the man who was called RFK was the president's brother. And he said, you are not going to play football in there with a segregated team. I don't know, when they friends first sent Jason Campbell out to play quarterback, I said to myself, I wonder if George Preston Marshall, how many times he's turned it over in his grave as he sees this. <laughs> anyway, um, I would conclude that the plight of the black poor in this country is something that shames us all. You see black homeless men if you walk the streets of Washington or drive through it. If you engage them, as I engage them when they come and invariably accost me when I'm putting gas in my car, and I talk to them, they can't read. They were never taught to read in the schools of Washington. And so then they went out and they did something and they did something more and they did something more and they ended up in prison. And they came back in midlife and they had nothing to offer this society at all except a redundant activity. Can I pump your gas for you, mister? It cost us a lot of money to incarcerate those guys. Costs us a lot of money to take care of the damage they do. Costs us a lot of money to insure our possessions because we are afraid of them. Costs us a lot because we lose whatever talents they might have had had those talents been developed. So um, I guess I've come back to give you a report on what I intend to do with my um, retirement. The fact is, I did retire when I did because I wanted to have a little gas in my tank to do this work. And I will say here to Peter, who graciously introduced me, um, to George and Joanne, who had hired me, and to my pal, Dean Sensor, who persuaded me that, um, yes, I could have some friends at uh, George Mason University who I would like a lot. You've enriched my life. You've enriched the lives of my children. I thank you. And my Robinson colleagues, what a bunch you are. Love you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.